Lord Jesus, thank you for my bride. Thank you for uh, the knowledge of you that she carries, and uh, thank you for her relationship with you. And uh, we open our hearts up, Lord. I believe that you're positioning us as a community for, uh, for greater glory. I believe that with all my heart, Lord, that there are unprecedented things ahead for us as a community in the very near future, that you're rent, you have a desire to rend the heavens and to manifest in, in new ways. Um, Lord, I, I believe that, that that's coming and coming soon, and so prepare your people. I just hear Haggai chapter one, it says consider your ways, that we would consider, Lord, how we're living in light of where we're going. That we'll consider how we're building in light of where you're leading us, and so uh, Holy Spirit, release your zeal for your house in this hour through Larissa, I pray in Jesus' name. And go Cowboys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Hey guys. I want to give a quick pastoral word before I jump in because Sometimes it can be crazy in here before we start when they're giving announcements, but we are having a baptism um, service, November something. You can look it up. Uh, er, first, first one in fifth, the fifth, thank you. Um, and I, I felt like it was important to point out, if you have confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to be baptized, water baptized. So if you have not been water baptized, you need to do that. It's a biblical mandate, and I don't have time to go into that, but you need to be water baptized. So please look into that. If Yeah, I'll leave that there. Look into that. Uh, I... Um, <laughs> the message that I shared in Argentina, the, the thrust of it was about being poor in spirit. And so when I actually fully intended on using a, a translator, I got up to simply greet everyone in Spanish. Um, and then I felt the Holy Spirit tell me in the moment, if you're going to speak on being poor in spirit, then you better put your money where your mouth is. And um, so in fear and trembling, I started, I just opened my mouth and, and kept going. It's, I, I can speak Spanish, but fluent is a continuum. And preaching in another language is a whole other ball game. And um, I, I was in the fear of the Lord and weepy the entire time because I was aware that he was anointing me for something that I could not do uh, in my, I, I've never done that before and I know what I can do and I knew I couldn't do what I was actually doing. It was a, 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 a very eye-opening experience to me about the, the power of God and I'll I'll say from a personal place, when we went on sabbatical, the, the one prayer that I had for myself, uh, the cry of my heart, was that he would rid me of all fear of man. And um, I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> but um, I, I want to live a life that's poor in spirit, that like Paul says, he doesn't come with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration. And this is, this is like the aim of my life. And um, it seems as though this morning I'm going to be on a similar trajectory. I'm not going to preach in Spanish, praise God. But uh, I need to let you in and into my morning uh, because as I, as I began to pray about this morning, um, I have felt the Lord clearly tell me, I want you to talk about the secret place. And the secret place is, if you're one of my USM students, you know it's one of my all-time favorite things to talk about. I love to talk about the secret place. And um, I really believe that where the church is headed, where our world is headed, that we will not survive if we don't have a personal, intimate, secret place walk with God. We will not make it. 
We, w- we will not make it. I really believe that. Not only that, but I believe it's the key to thriving in life and in God is having a daily secret place, time with him. And so I was excited when I felt the Lord speak that to me. And then um, I went to bed and I had a dream. Let me say this. Psalm 84, which is maybe my favorite chapter in the Bible, talks about hearts set on pilgrimage. That's us, yes? Our hearts are on a pilgrimage, and it describes going through valleys of weeping and turning them into places of springs, but there's this phrase where it says, each goes, no, it says, they go, say that with me, they go from strength to strength. And then it says, till each one appears before him in Zion. And it's always caught my eye how there's a they and a each one. And a few weeks back, I, I gave a message um, about being a part of the body and how important it is to be an active part of the body, how important showing up is, how important gathering weekly is. And so there's an element in the Christian walk that is definitely communal. You cannot do it alone. And then there's this mystery that you also can't have someone do it for you. There's a we go, we're going on pilgrimage together, and then we show up one day and it's me standing before him. And so the secret place to me is, is, is the place where the where we are strengthened together, but when I stand before him alone, there's something there, right? There's a history. There's a, he says, I know you. We've been together. You know me, I know you. Um, Okay, so then last night I had a dream, and the Lord has, you know, for lack of a better word, cut me as I dreamt last night. I was in an airport, and I was actually with, with our team, And I couldn't find my boarding pass. Anybody ever have anyone? We were in some foreign country. I couldn't find my boarding pass. I was sitting in front of a computer that I found to log on to my airline account to get a new boarding pass. My account wasn't working. The clock was ticking. They were boarding. Like, it was a stress, stress, stress dream. I'm logging on to my account on on the computer, and I had to, you know, create a new account because I couldn't remember my password and my username, anybody. Um, So here I am creating a new account, and I put in my password in capital letters, Lo, which is a nickname people have for me. Lo loves God. And it didn't work. And then I walked off, and I walked to the gate, and I'm asking the gate agent for a boarding pass, and he prints me out one, and immediately I can't find it. He, I literally had it in my hand, can't find it, it's gone. And he can't find it, and, and I see people, the pl- like the end of the line, people are getting in on the plane, and I, I'm there without my boarding pass, stressed. I wake up with my muscles clenched, I'm sweating, my, my jaws clenched. Has anybody ever had a stressful dream? <laughs> Um, and, uh, I didn't think much of it till I go to sit with the Lord to prepare to talk to you about the secret place. And he said, you know what your password was? Lo loves God and it's not enough. You won't be able to find your way with your love for me. It will fall short. And I was cut again. by his love for me. And the danger of standing in front of people like this who already love him, like you're already in church, you're the choir, right? The danger of standing in front of you and talking about the secret place is we can make it a work so fast. Well, this is what you're supposed to do. And if I go every day and I sit with my Bible and I sing and I pray, then I will get whatever, whatever it is that you think God, God gives you. And we can make it into a work. Or if I don't, then these things will happen. 
And that's the danger that I'm aware of when I talk to you about coming before him daily in the secret place. And so before I talk to you about the secret place, I have to talk to you about the love of God. Because the only password that would get me anywhere would be God loves low. <laughs> it's very simple, I know, but Christians are the first ones to forget. Especially the really radical ones. We can get really zealous. So, I want to look at a couple scriptures with you. Say yes. Here's the thing about the love of God. Paul says in Ephesians, do you require power from the Holy Spirit to understand and receive a love that surpasses knowledge? So I can be a talking head at you about the love of God. And it won't change you. But you can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, encounter a love that's so deep and high and long and wide that you will be rearranged on the inside. And that is why you need to be in the secret place. So, did I say First John? I thought it. Oh, I said Ephesians, but now it's First John. <laughs> First John chapter four. Did you know that you never grow up out of the gospel? You never ever grow up out of the gospel. Jesus' disciples saw the sick healed and demons flee. And most of us haven't seen that much of that. And they were so excited when they came back and said, Lord, the demons were submitting to us in your name. And he said, no, 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 that's not what you need to rejoice about. You rejoice that your name's written in the book. You never grow up out of the gospel. Because the gospel is the love of God. I'm not like this normally. <laughs> uh, okay. First John 4. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Hop down to verse 19. And we love him because he first loved us. One of our mandates in this house is to call you over and over again to first love. And in, in Matthew chapter 22, remember Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded and said what? Yeah, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, come on, and mind and strength. But then Jesus added something, because the question was, what's the greatest commandment? 
And Jesus said, here it is. And he said, this is the first and greatest commandment. And I want, I want to look at the word first. This word first in Matthew 22 is the same word first in 1 John 4, 19. So this word in the Greek is protos. Say protos. It means foremost. In time, in place, in order, or importance. Pretty simple. First. Well, how did God love you first? How did he protos you? Before the foundation of the world, a lamb was slain for you. There was a plan to love you first before you were a thought in anybody's mind. To love you first. To protos you, to put you first. And so when Jesus says, love God first, this is the first commandment, it only comes from a well of reception. In fact, when we first built this room out, it had a different name than the prayer room. Is anyone here long enough to remember what it was called? It was called the receiving room. Because truly, Michael spoke on Thanksgiving last night. All we are is receivers. All the love we have to give is love that we've first received. That's why this meal has a name. It's the Eucharist. It means to give thanks. It's all we have because we've received everything. If I, Mallory, if I handed you 100 bucks right now, what would you say? Thank you. The reason why we enter his courts, his gates, with thanksgiving is because we've received something. It's a natural response when you receive a gift. Thank you. Right? Let's look at Romans 5. And then I'm going to talk to you about the secret place. Romans 5, verse 6. If your life in God is dependent on your zeal or your love, you will run out. You will run out. You will run dry. It might look the same. This is the weird part, is that the actions might be the very same. The person who's the love of God is wrecking them and compelling them, they may be doing the exact same actions as the person who is doing things in their own strength. But one will burn out. Look at Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, (laughs) woohoo! in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Say, that was me? Keep going. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Keep going. For if when we were enemies, say that was me, 
We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Keep going. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Do you know why Jesus came to earth? It wasn't to give you a boarding pass to heaven. (laughs) Although he did that. He came to put you back into relationship with someone whose heart longs for you. Because we're all orphans and we walk around acting like orphans. We walk around acting like orphans and treating each other like orphans until the spirit of Jesus fills us and there's something inside of us called the spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. Well, what does that make Jesus? It makes him your big brother. I know that sounds like, did she just say that? But he's, he's called the firstborn of many brethren. It says in Hebrews, he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Meaning if God has a house, Jesus might be in the bunk above you. <laughs> Take that for a minute. Now, if, if your big brother, when he walked the earth, the perfect son of God, if he had to draw away constantly to be alone with his father, then there might be a reason for us to pay attention when he said, when you pray, go in your closet, shut the door, and your father who is in Secret. I think about him. I think about all the times when he, you know, he didn't have a home, it says. So he had to find a closet out and about, right? I want you to look at these, these moments where we see Jesus withdrawing um, to pray. Do you guys have those for me? Thank you. There's four times, there's probably more, but I, 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 I found these four. This is at the beginning of his ministry, and he had, he had just performed several miracles, and it says in Mark chapter 135, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And it says everyone was looking for him. They had to go find him. You know what you and I would have done? We would have left a little note. I'll be on the mountain in case you all need me. And he just got up and left and said, they'll find me if they need me. I'm going to hang out here as long as I can. Uh, But I, I need you to see the context. I don't know what Jesus was experiencing in his heart at the beginning of his ministry. Well, if you rewind a little bit further, you think about the very first thing that happened at the beginning of his ministry is he was alone for 40 days. Driven by the Holy Spirit and then ministered to by angels, but guaranteed he was meeting with his father. Right? So what do you think may have been going on in his heart when he had to withdraw early hours in the morning? What did he need to hear from his father? I don't know. Look at this next one. This this portion in John chapter 6 is after he fed the 5,000 and before he walked on water. This one's fascinating. 
Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. I don't know about you, but if if they were about to make me king, I might feel pretty proud of myself. I'm not saying that's what Jesus felt. My point is, he had just seen God feed 5,000 people through his hands, through his prayer. And he's about to go walk on top of water. (laughs) And somewhere in there, the thing that he knew that he needed to do was go be alone with his father. Right? Because we live by the praises of men or die by them. But if we have that time with our dad, he's, he's constantly speaking identity over us. That when we come back out, it doesn't matter if you're clapping at me or mocking me because my, if I've heard my dad... Look at, look at the next one. Before he called the 12. How about before you're about to make huge decisions about who you walk with, about who you connect with, about who you pour into? What does he do? It came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. I don't think Jesus, he was fully man. I don't think he just automatically knew. I'm choosing him, 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 and him, him. I think he had to go sit with the Father and say, show me who. Show me who. Prepare them. Prepare me. Oh, that one? He's going to betray me? Okay. You sure? What was he talking about to his father all night? I don't know, but I know he needed it. Look at the next one. Oh. After the Last Supper... So he had just identified his betrayer, washed their feet, shared a meal with them. He's going to the cross, but it says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. Here's the key. As he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. And we know that story where he went to Gethsemane and he sweat drops of blood. I have to think those 12 that were following him, watching him, that when they said, teach us to pray, it's because they knew there was something key for them. There was something to be learned And so we have time, praise God, to look at Matthew chapter 6. This is so beautiful because maybe we have insight into what the all-night prayer meetings between Jesus and the Father were like. Maybe we can read the Lord's Prayer and see what they might have been talking about. What was that exchange like? Let's, let's read again, starting in verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father. This is, you could spend a year sitting on this phrase. Who is in the secret place. That's where he is. That's where he is. Let me say it again. That's where He is. (laughs) And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. 
And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Your father knows the things you have need before you ask him. And in this manner, therefore, pray, our father. Would you imagine with me for a minute? Remember I told you Jesus is your big brother? Will you imagine for me with a minute when you go in your secret place, wherever that is for you, that you look up to the Father who's in secret, and when you say our, imagine Jesus sitting next to you, and you're looking at the Father together, and you're saying, our Father. Who's in heaven? Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Imagine Jesus in all those scenarios. Miracles performed, they're wanting to make him king, big decisions to make. And this is, this is what he does. He goes into secret, and this is how he prays. Dad. Oh, you're my dad. You're my dad. Thank you that you have sent me here and that you're with me and that I'm returning back to you. Imagine the history and the word between Jesus saying, Father. Imagine the history between the two of them. Dad. Forget that that, that was a radical thing for them to hear. This is not how... how the Jews prayed. <laughs> this alone was a radical idea. Father? Not just that, but our Father? They want to make me king, but your kingdom come. I don't want to go to the cross, but your will be done. Here's what Here's where I want to really hone in for the next few minutes. Give us this day our daily bread. If I could, could, could give you anything today, it would be for you to hear loud and clear the invitation that your Father has food for you every day day. And we took the meal and we said, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So when you sit with the Father who is in secret, yes, he's here. He's absolutely here with us, but he's in secret. And if you only meet with him in corporate places, you're probably so hungry. And when your soul is hungry, it eats things that are bad for it if it doesn't have bread already inside of it. And your Father feeds you the bread that comes from heaven. This is the bread. This is your daily bread. It's the person of Christ. Christ who is wisdom. If you're in need of wisdom, it comes in the form of the Father feeding you Christ every day, your righteousness, your wisdom, your love, your identity, it all comes in the form of Christ given to you, fed to you bit by bit by the Father in his gentleness, in his, oh, he's so patient, so gentle, so aware of, your, of all your needs. One of my favorite scriptures is how the Lord walks gently with those that have young. I can't remember it exactly, but I've, so many times when I've gone in the secret place, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm weak and I'm broken. I've got, I've got kids and I'm, I'm, I've some, you know, there've been years where I felt like I was drowning in it. <laughs> and he's fed me gently with his hand. Just what I needed. 
I'm telling you, there's bread for you waiting in the secret place. And all I can do here is, is scratch your hunger and say, go eat. It's so fresh. It's warm. It's hot. It's good. It satisfies. It satisfies if you are unsatisfied. I'm telling you, there is only one way and place to find it, and it's when the Father feeds you in secret. And he, he, he's so wonderful because he's specific to your day, specific to your needs. Lord, what is the bread that I need to eat today? And you'll be amazed at what you hear. You'll be amazed at the wisdom of heaven for you. Like, forget the podcast. Forget it. Eat the bread. Get the bread. It, it, <laughs> he, he may say, I mean, I, I heard him say this week, Larissa. You could, gee, listen, Jesus said, I have food you don't know about. My food, my bread is to do the will of my father. So when you sit with him and you ask for bread, for daily bread, you start to hear, what is your will today, Lord? What, what's my focus today? How would you have me? What's the lens that I have for the day? And there are days where I've sat with him and he says, your bread today is to enjoy your children. Not, your bread is not to tolerate them or to worry about your bread for today, whatever day this is. It could have been a Friday. It could have been a, whatever. Your bread today, Larissa, is simply enjoy the children that I've given you. That's, that will feed you today from my hand. Some days, some days he says, here are the things that I have for you today. And there may be someone that he brings to my heart, brings to my mind that I, I wouldn't have thought of on my own. And he'll say, there's bread for you. There'll be bread for you as you reach out to this person today. Share this. Encourage them. Be aware of them. Notice them. I don't know. I can't give you, like, obviously, if I tried to give Jackson my bread, it would be weird. Like, Jackson's not going to go enjoy my children for his bread. He's not, he doesn't have my... <laughs> He isn't, he's not cannibalism here, but he, he doesn't have my mandate, he doesn't have my life, he doesn't have my calling. Your bread that comes from the Father is, it is, it's so specific. And it comes, it does come in the form of his word. You know, Jesus is the bread of life, but he's also the word of God made flesh. The Father wants to feed you. Father wants to feed you. He wants you to be satisfied. He wants you to be familiar with his voice, his emotions, his heart. I, if I had time, I would go through and talk to you about all the ways that he, he ministers to you in the secret place. Like forgiveness is a huge way. You probably need to be forgiven and forgive every day. That's the likelihood as you walk on the earth is that you, there will be people that you need to forgive every day. God bless you if that's not true, but it is for me. So in the Lord's Prayer, we see, give us our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, and forgive us as we forgive. This is part of your bread. Oh, that way you can walk around with a free heart. Oh, you don't have to walk around with a bitter heart. Oh, so every day you get to let go of the people that have hurt you and offended you. You get to bless them so you can walk around like Jesus did free because he's your big brother and he wants you to be just like him and in that place is the provision to do those things that you cannot do on your own 
I'll tell you a quick story and then we'll, we'll, we'll respond. J. Lou, would you come up? Um, I remember when, when, one day I was sitting with the Lord in a secret place in the morning and uh, there was a, a particular relationship that I, was very painful to me and I was, one of the things you can do in the secret place with your father is pour out your heart. What's troubling you? What bothers you? What is hurting you? What are you, what are you frustrated about? What are you mad about? He wants to know. And so I was doing that. <laughs> they did this. He's a good dad. He's patient. And he sees it all anyways. You might as well tell him. Hey, the, 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 <laughs> the freedom comes when you know that he sees it and he pours out his love anyway. And you're both acknowledging that's there. And he says, yeah, but my grace is sufficient. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And then it's not the thought of it. It's the reality of it. The exchange between you and him. So... This one particular morning, I I, I was emoting about a certain relationship. And when I was done whining or complaining or whatever it was I was doing, I heard the father gently say, you're bitter. I said, ooh, that's true. (laughs) I am bitter. And, you know, he's so gentle that when he says something like that, it breaks, it's like oil in a hard place. It begins to soften. I said, Lord, I am bitter. I'm hurt. He says, I know. Let's talk about it. And so he began to so tenderly speak to my heart and, lead me into forgiveness and so I wept for him and I repented for harboring unforgiveness and hear me the pain was still there the 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 offense hadn't been fixed something began to shift in my heart that day and um, this was a months old scenario. It had been months with no contact with this person. And I kid you not, within about an hour, a text came from that person. It said, can we meet? Can we talk? And there was, there was reconciliation, there was restoration. But I am fully confident that my unforgiveness and my bitterness had held a wall in the spirit that there was no there wasn't room there wasn't room in my own heart for reconciliation what's my point my point is the father one of the ways that he feeds you bread is he he tends your heart in that place ah oh, he's so good cares about the little things and the big things and you don't grow up and not need your dad you don't outgrow that he doesn't need you to walk around toughing it out for him (laughs) he's unimpressed so would you stand up I I know it's 12.01. If you need to go, go, but please respond to him on your own. If you can stay a couple minutes, I would be grateful. I can't... I could give you formulas... And I could say, you should spend this much time and you should have this reading plan and you should pray this way and you should do this journal, you should do this devotional, but it would all be pointless. If you haven't felt the love of God and been provoked 
And if you have, then he's big enough to equip you in that place. And his Holy Spirit's big enough to teach you and to lead you to the Father. He's big enough. And he's desiring it. So I'm going to let these guys just minister and we'll respond. And then I'll call the prayer team up. Let's take a couple minutes. give you um, I want to give you an opportunity if you haven't known the love of the Father if the gospel was not presented to you in a clear way where you understood that God did everything, removed every obstacle to be with you then I want to give you a chance to 
respond to that love today. So I'm going to have our prayer team come up. If you want to respond, say yes to the love of the Father through Christ Jesus. You're welcome to come up and pray with us. If you want prayer for anything whatsoever, we would love to pray with you. It would be our privilege and honor. We love you. Be blessed.